So today I want to share um, a number of insights from this last week, but I'll start off with a story which I may have mentioned before, but many years ago when I was a young nun, uh, I came to meet possibly the oldest nun, living nun at that time, um, and she lived, um, oh, by the name, her name was Ke Jung Sim. I should honour her title and her name at that, in her life. Uh, she lived in a very wonderful temple, and this temple had what is said to be a thousand Buddhas and a thousand stupas, and what is now really just the remains, perhaps just a head or a part of that Buddha is remaining after a thousand years. But they were built at a time that Korea was going through a great struggle. And they brought all the community, all the village people and the farmers together in the area. And they said that it supposedly happened in a night, but let's say it happened in a week. They all created their own Buddha and several together would create these beautiful pagodas and stupas to honour the history and the tradition of the Buddha so as to help protect the country at that time. And still today, all over this temple by the name of Unjusai, you see the remains of these Buddhas. Some were carved in rocks lying down, some were are all standing up against cliffs of rock on the walls and others just in part and beautiful big pagodas. It makes you wonder, you know, how even a few people put them together with big slabs of rock. And this very elderly nun who was now at that time 102, she lived to be the age of 104, I believe, and I was in my 30s and... I had heard about her. This was a branch of the home temple where I lived in Songkwang Sa. And so I went to visit. They had been, her and her disciple had been very engaged in a building project, rebuilding the old remains of the temple and to bring back some of the former glory of the place. And I went and knocked on the door and was ushered in, you just slide a little door. She was in a little hut in one little room, you know, a little room maybe between me and those front cushions. Nothing in the room, which is the, the common phenomenon of Korean temple rooms, just a polished paper floor and this elderly old nun sitting there in the middle under a a blanket and the floors in Korea are heated so it's quite comfortable and the, the doors have paper on them so you have the white light from the outside coming through sometimes a little chilly but you get used to that and together she called me in and took my hand and ushered me to sit under the blanket with her and while she was gripping my hand with her right hand, with her left hand, she was rolling black and white prayer beads. 108 white and 108 black were just rolling through her fingers. And her disciple came in and she said, uh, she is a Western nun. Because I guess at her elderly age, she couldn't see well and the disciple yelled in her ear, which means a big nose nun, <laughs> which indicates the identity of a Westerner. <laughs> so I, the Ko Jengi Snim, was sitting there and she looked at me, with scrutinised my face and then roared laughing. And she squeezed my hand and she said, never mind, let's just become enlightened together. <laughs> it was a, such a beautiful uh, sentiment to all that was going on for me in my mind at that time. 
everything was stilled. Let's practice together. Let's do it together. And let's do it now. You know, the culture, <coughs> the differences of culture, the differences of my shape and form to hers, the differences of language. I spoke enough Korean to share um, a little conversation. And I asked her a few things of which she either chose to uh, talk about or say a, a small few words to or not. And there was a lot of space. And so the emphasis of my talk today is about this importance of the space. Without this space between you and me, between you and others or your cushion to the next cushion, nothing happens, nothing exists. But in a very spacious environment where two nuns from totally opposite spectrums of life, culturally, age-wise, in a totally empty room other than us and the quilt, then space and light are very poignant. And the long pauses between my questions and her answer. But the primary answer to my question about what has she uh, done in her past? What has her life been around, about? And she looked at me very directly and said, what past? Past was not even a matter of the conversation. Her disciple came in and said, oh, you know, you've been washing your own clothes until you were 92. And then she filled in with other things. You would even come and help cook until you were well into your 80s. You've built this temple over the last 10 years. And she looked at her disciple and said, again, that is not the past. That is what you're bringing up in this moment about something you recall. So there was very little to add. What could I add in the way of conjuring something in my mind to chat about? I just sat. And she sat and she rolled her beads I asked about the black and white beads and she said, once I went to India, this she did recall, once I went to India and I had my white Korean beads, my, they're called Yeomju and they're made from a tree by the same name. The Ju is the bead, the Yeom is the name of the tree and the seed of this tree, it is called a Buddhist tree. The seed of the tree creates a very lovely little bead that they make into this prayer bead. And she said, I had my Korean beads with me. And when I went to India, somebody gave me these black beads. And ever since, I've been using them together. And I reflected on this. For her now, there was no difference there was no black and white. There was no cultural difference. There was no past and future. There was just this vibrant presence of our interaction, of just being. Last week, I um, and some of you here were part of a conference little one-day seminar which was to inaugurate something that also represents much of this very deep 
uh, understanding. It was a little conference to inaugurate women of Buddhism coming together and sharing. Sharing in many very important objectives that we all share to create a network, and communicate and support one another, in this case it was Buddhist nuns, to function as a communication between each other in a, no, in a way of a notice board and to bring attention to what is particular to the female gender in Buddhism and to promote, particularly to promote harmony and dialogue amongst the Buddhist traditions, to war, work towards greater equality here they have talked about gender equality in education and training institutions, instructions and ordina ordination. But we can look beyond that to a far greater equality that belongs to all beings, not just human, not just men, not just women. To foster compassion and social action for the benefit of humanity and to promote awareness of where, in this case, Sakyadita, the daughters of the Buddha, have a conference every two years that bring people from all over the world, men and women, to share in these and other important objectives and to share what they are doing about it and how they have come to develop their communities and their ways of practice and the history of Buddhism. And here also to act as advocates for the protection of nat natural environment and the protection of the planet from global warming. And to, very importantly, build on relationships with other faith traditions in the wider community. So we came together to share in the possibility to bring women in Australia who have an interest who have a practice in the Dharma, to come and talk to one another. And a very interesting thing happened. In a room that was with as many people here today, perhaps um, a few more, although it's a very full room, it began in an interesting way, which was to introduce the committee, the interim committee, who had been working on the projects of Sakyadita, the object to create and inaugurate this chapter in Australia. But they started to do something that created a polarisation. That space seemed to be sucked out in a moment in the intentions and interests of those who had come. And it wasn't anything that was really it was very much a part of an objective here. But it was an, an objective that is something many of us are working on. But in the context of bringing women together to listen to one another, to hear about what it is we can share with one another, which are very broad, and um, it offers many opportunities for dialogue. Suddenly, the view of the problems we have in this level, this environmental, political level in Australia, touched something so deep in everybody that it was not what people had come from or could talk about or wanted to even create a resolution on, which was the point here. It was something that seemed beyond us. It was, for me, a little out of context. We hadn't talked about the objectives, really, and we hadn't got to talk about what we're here for. But it was an important subject, and it's an interesting thing how in a place where we have not yet developed the space, we have not yet communicated with one another through even a look, 
through even an acknowledgement. That's suddenly a very large problem. That affects us all. Is very present. So we were able to move through it. There was a little bit of agitation and people said, we need some space. We need some time out. We need a cup of tea. So for a moment, we took a few moments, we took that time to just stop, reflect, have a little break, create a little fresh space in the room, and then to come back to what it is we are here for. A couple of very interesting comments were raised. One by Aya Padma, which was to, we have so much to talk about in our own backyard. We have so many issues to bring up about what I am doing and what am I, I'm hoping to achieve. And we always have that. That is something that is always present in our life. The objectives of our life, the intentions. But without this space, we cannot even discuss them. And throughout the day, other very interesting things arose. We suddenly realised how there was, uh, I think, about six or seven nuns present, mostly Theravada and myself, and how little so many people in the room knew about Buddhist nuns. It's very interesting. We all come from a traditional Buddhist background, and I think many of you here have seen me speak once a month on various issues relating to Mahayana, Theravada, Buddhist nuns, meditation. But to think so many of the people in the room had come to Buddhism primarily through just meditation, just dealing with the personal issues and personal suffering, and had no context necessarily of tradition. Maybe they had studied in a Theravada Buddhist meditation retreat or had done a little bit of meditation online. But quite a number had actually not really understood the lives of Buddhist nuns. So it was a very good opportunity for the nuns to speak and for others to listen. It was also a very great opportunity for women working in education, working on projects for educating young girls in other cultures, in third world cultures, in cultures that are still developing. It was a great opportunity for people to talk about health and exercise. So many of these became little forums, little workshops that were um, we could choose where to go and what to do. But sometimes I find that when we're actually um, in a situation where we have a very strong objective of what we're wanting to gain from that situation, we feel very confined by the limitation of our objectives. If we sit in meditation and we have the objective to calm the body and mind, to still become present, become aware, inquire, what often happens? The body gets tense, the mind gets fixated on some part of the body that is ailing and throwing up discomfort. We get occupied with a thought or a, a memory or a, you know, a problem. And what happens? That fixation solidifies that problem. It makes it very hard 
to get beyond. In the great world, if we look at, we have a big boulder, a big rock in front of us. It's very hard to walk beyond it. We have to walk over it. We have to walk around it. But actually, in reality, that boulder, all it is, is massed energy that is moving at a very, very great speed. We don't think of this, but scientifically, this is what's happening. What is moving at a much slower speed, we can connect to. Waves in the water, we can see them rolling and rolling out. But on a great faster level, this is happening in denser places, in places that become obstructions. As in that room when a subject became difficult to contemplate, it was too big, not only one, we had five objectives offered to us there. <laughs> they were just so massive, you know, we didn't even know how anyone in this room could talk about it. So, I'll give another little story. I was, just yesterday, uh, um, a local friend came to visit and she wanted to go for a walk, so we went down to the the, there's a very beautiful waterfall in King Lake. If you ever come to King Lake, you go to the National Park and you go for a walk, a lovely stroll and look at the waterfall. So we're having this stroll and while we're walking, I'm hearing the problems with her daughter and I'm listening and I'm looking, you know, because I hadn't been for a walk there for a while and I'm listening and the problem's intensifying in her mind. As she's relaying, it's becoming, you know, something to really share, to talk about. And it is quite, you know, in that context of a life. It was what was absorbing her life. She couldn't go back to work. She had to be with her daughter and the grandson. And I stopped and I said, oh, I came here after the bushfires. And I looked in this very spot and it was just ash and a few black stumps. Look how much has grown. And she looked and she saw one beautiful plant. It actually stood out, a native plant in flower in winter. And she said, oh, isn't that beautiful? And I said, yes, and when you look past that beauty, can you see what is behind it? There was a ledge of some rocks. Beneath the rocks, the soil had gathered, mounded, and out of the soil, all sorts of things had grown, including enough to allow this lovely shrub, this native bush to grow. Now, what we do in life, whether it is something beautiful, or something that is difficult. We focus on, particularly the problem, but we focus on what stands out first. And we often don't see the context of how it has developed, how it has come into being. But for me, it was very easy. Seven years ago, that was just ash. There was not anything but out of the seeds of those plants. I could see a hundred plants in that small one meter, two meters, square meters of view in front of me, including the rock, including the shapes and color and depth and light and moisture and all sorts of textures. My eyes absorbed it all. I didn't actually see the beauty of the plant straight off because so much was going on. You know, I was absorbing. After listening, just listening, just using this one ear for a little while to take in what I was listening to, this was saying so much more. So I pointed out sometimes when we just focus on the problem, we just focus on the pain. You all know from a retreat, when you just focus on the pain, it 
intensifies. But if you put it into the greater context, you give space to your thoughts, then what happens? There is a development of the senses that becomes still. And in that stillness, it's not a particular sound or a particular sight. Seeing is happening, hearing is happening. But many subtler experiences, so many, that the mind cannot label at all, cannot grasp at all. And so what it does, a state of equanimity develops in the mind, a state of acceptance. And you find yourself just being there with it. And this is what we do. Well, this is a very way, a good way for us to develop the capacity to be with. So in the context of Sakyadita, we very quickly learn to be with what was arising. After our cup of tea and a little bit of space, we could come back and participate more fully, more engaging in what the reason was for this large gathering of people who had some interest, who had taken great time out to come, what we could share. That is the same as when we sit in this room and I look at you all looking so attentively. It is not just about what I'm talking about. Actually, you're possibly quite objectifying what I'm sharing, but it is coming from, you know, a whole depth of your experience to this moment. That when you sit there, you are sharing it with everybody. You are all part of this collective experience in this moment. I just may be pointing a, <laughs> making a note to something that triggers an awareness, a greater awareness. And the greater awareness triggers greater freedom. And the greater freedom triggers connection. That's what's happening. Just as all those plants sitting under a boulder were all connecting. They weren't sitting on top of each other. They somehow had grown in those spaces together because of conditions. And Buddhism talks about this and Zen Buddhism talks about this. And very much sitting with the elderly nun in that empty room with the light coming through, the subtle light coming through on a chilly winter day like today. That situation was talking about this. We often think that, uh, you know, when you go to live in a monastery, it is always about these very harmonious environments where everybody sits in meditation all day and the nuns were sharing otherwise. They were sharing about how much they have to be the counsellors to everybody who walks in the door, how much work they have to do every day, how sometimes the place gets quite uh, an unhappy place or an unfulfilling place for some of those who have the ideal that this is going to be the lifestyle that would take them to liberation. But this is in all our lives. Every one of you have your, your situations that bring up positives and bring up obstacles. 
Every one of us has that. But in that, do we have the spaciousness of mind to see things in our own mind, things in place that are just there, just growing in that situation, just unfolding in that situation? If we had the capacity be, to be like a lens that can see, you know, you see sometimes those lens that show a flower as it's blooming. If we had the capacity to see that, then everything would be just blooming, would be in a process of changing and developing and becoming. And I was looking at, when I was doing my prayers this morning, I had helped, I was reflecting on this, I had helped uh, another Buddhist nun move recently. And, you know, in that moving process, there's always so many things. What do you keep? What do you give away? What do you, you know, throw away? And, uh, and slowly, you know, as people come and take what they want, especially when you say, look, you know, I really want to let a lot go, Lots of people come and say, I want that and my name's on that. And you can see, you know, the chair's got this person's name and this is for the, you know, Salvation Army and this is for Jiguang. And, <laughs> and you walk around, you know, mind you, Jiguang didn't take much away. But one of the things I noticed as the, 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 the luggage and the possessions and the things start to subside the light and the space and the openness grows. We've all experienced this. This is So, you know, the last day, I, I spent four days helping Sanim and then, you know, I had a break for a couple of days and then came back again, I think, on, on the, the Sunday morning or something. And the last day, I... Um, I did as much as I could then. I had to go and teach at four. And we'd almost got Snim right up to the door. <laughs> she was still determined to do more. I believe she stayed till about nine o'clock at night. But by this time, you know, everything had found its way somewhere else. And um, I'd taken two loads, load off to the rubbish tip. I'd taken loads to op shops. And I still had a trailer load, you know. <laughs> <laughs> of a, the last remnants, the bed and the few other things that were left around to, to take and deliver elsewhere. But I looked back, and as I looked back, I could see from the, the lounge right through the house, there was no obstruction. I mean, there were still walls and there was a roof and there was a floor, but my mind just flowed as if I had never seen it before. And light was at the end in the little window, far end of the room where I'd sometimes rest. The light was shining towards me and I thought, ah, you know, it's quite, these moments are quite magical. When you're working very hard and you're tired, you don't see them. When you stop, it's right there. And I went outside and Sim said, oh, there's some lovely succulent flowers. Take a few of those home. So I took them home, cut a few and put them in my vase at home. And going back to the point a moment ago of, you know, succulent flowers are often very, very beautiful. And these ones are ones that we don't look at as much. But in this single flower, there were hundreds of other little flowers and for some reason this morning they were in full bloom. This perfect little yellow, tiny, tiny daisy-like formations in this one flower had come to their fullness, their fruition. We know in the next day, week, it, it's starting to decline and become something else. But if we are there in the moment, this is all the time, happening all the time. Whether I'm looking in the garden or looking into your face, into your eyes, into your smiles, it's there. 
just as when I looked into the 102-year-old nun, into her totally free, open, uncontrived, innocent, pure face. It's still clear in my mind. It's also the face my little grandniece, I took her to the museum a few weeks ago. She's this tiny one-something-year-old <laughs> who's already completely fearless in the museum. She just took off, you know, anywhere and everywhere. And at one point, she must have thought she'd lost me. And I'm standing, I just would stand and her mother would be watching her too. And at one point, she came running up and she looked up into my face with this great laughter. She had found me, or we had found each other in that moment. That totally pure, joyful innocence that we sometimes experience when we're just there to be with it. You know, if I'd been sort of thinking about other things or worrying about where she was, no, I was just observing. She was standing at the men's toilets for about 15 minutes. A mother has this wonderful capacity to just observe her, allow her to have a little movement. And she's watching all these people come in and out of this wall. And she couldn't quite figure it up. They say, they look, you know, we're just standing there. They say, walked in, they had to sort of go round her to go into the toilet. They push this door and she looks in, she looks up at them and they come out, she looks up at them and they walk past and she's watching these objects going in and out, absolutely fascinated, 10, 15 minutes. While she was trying to get into the, the bathroom with her mother. You know, so we sometimes lose this sense of wonder in space. We lose it in time, in our constructs of time. We lose it in a mind that gets full of our dream of life, full of our hopes and full of our fears. And we also lose it in what we want and what we don't want. Admittedly, a large number didn't want the way the Sakyadita mini meeting began. They were there for something else. I later reflected, it would have been fine either way. But in the momentum, people connected for it to be something else. That is a different story. When we connect to make change, that's important. But much of the time, it is about nothing. Most of the time. <laughs> when was the last really important thought you had? Coming here, probably. <laughs> what did you say? Yeah, tell me. Last time I went in bed. Oh, that was an important thought, was it? Oh, you must have been very tired that day. I know you right now. You are really right now, okay. That's probably why that thought's come up. <laughs> yeah. So if we actually think about what it is that we had that was important... But actually, the last really important thought you had has just passed. Because that's the only thought you've just had. And it's gone again. Can you see? And when we give space to that, every thought and every action is very important. We take out the self and the judgments and the expectations. And I just want to finish. Um, 
As usual, I have a lot of notes that I don't touch on, but <laughs> I wanted to bring to point once uh, my teacher asked me, do you know how to open your hand? And I said, of course I know how to open my hand, you know. I probably didn't say that, I probably just opened my hand. But I thought, of course I know how to open my hand. He said, you also know how to use your eyes, how to hear, how to use your tongue and your mouth. Because of this, we know, he said, I know, you know how to be enlightened. And whatever I can tell you, it is not it. It is not enough. It is just like that old nun saying, I know where you are now. What the past is, it isn't. And what you think it's going to be, it isn't going to be. And we often talk about this uh, word, you know, everything is because of karma. Somebody said to me, everything is because of karma. We've come together because of karma. And there's a very interesting misconception about karma. You've heard this, I'm sure, many times. But it's often seen purely through this concept of the law of cause and effect. It's actually not. Literally, karma means action, an intentional action. And the Buddha put it in this way that it is uh, an action driven by an intention, satina, which leads to future consequences. It's not a fixed, hard factor. It's what we are doing that brings about the next action. If we just saw it in the sense, it also the word law in this is probably a poor translation. But if we just saw it in a sense of retribution, we would always feel there is no escape. You know. And this was never the Buddha's intention. When we bring space to this concept, when we open our mind to it and contemplate it, we see that, you know, it is based on this 12 links of dependent origination. You know, all these links make a circle, but each link is dependent on the one before it. All the causes that create the conditions and when one link is broken, the chain no longer is. So when one unwholesome, unclear, illusory, illusory, delusory thought is completely severed, then so our actions will never be done in any illusory way. They will be done as a whole. We will never see ourselves as an individual link. We will see ourselves as a whole. We will never see time as something that is a projection, that is 
finite or fixed. We will always see it as a flow of conditions. And so in this light, karma doesn't have to be a bondage. It is something that we become more and more present with how to be and how to do. And the being is just subtle, a doing. The being is being in your deeper awareness. And even awareness itself is subtler thoughts. But the doing is when we act, we utilize this body to benefit ourselves and benefit others. So for creating uh, an organization where Buddhist women and Buddhist men and those of even other faith and tradition can connect for the better and greater purposes that are more difficult to do on one's own, the environment, the detention centres, these political issues that are all being promised to do greater changes in the elections that are coming. Then we have the space to actually engage in some important action that can be of greater benefit to the world. So I think I'll finish here. And uh, I think you've been offered some things to reflect on over the next little while. But thank you for sharing such attention and good intention to be very present today. So is there any questions we always like to ask? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, just an interest of your initial statement. How can you deny there's a past if you raise the concept of recall? I mean, I'm not trying uh, to get controversial. No, no, no it's fine. It yeah. In the present, in the moment. But yeah. The fact is that if you don't learn from your mistakes, you're bound to repeat them. Yeah. Well, it's not that the past, you know, the, pa the past is this. You know, what you're looking at is always reflectant of the past. Yes. And so it's not going anywhere. It's what we carry with us and we utilise from our experience, our knowledge, our practice that takes us into this presence with more uh, capacity to be. Sure. So it's never something that's separated. It cannot be separated. And it is uh, maybe, you know, um, as I perhaps could have elucidated more in that analogy of being with the old nun, without the context of her 102 years of practice and incredible work, you know, even though she was not needing to go back there to, to, to elucidate it in an academic and intellectual way, she wasn't going to tell her story per se. She was showing it. She was revealing it in every movement of the beads, yeah. you know. And she was, it was revealed in the environment that she was building up. Yeah. And it, actually she passed away just as it finished. Yeah. And so, you know, her past was very relevant in her story because it was a long past. It was yeah, a long story. It well, it only empowers the present. So when the actions, now this is going back to the action aspect of the karmic causes, is the actions that we do now is, of course, creating who we are now and creating who we're becoming. Absolutely. So that's quite clear. But is also, it is not limited by just my action 
my past. The point really is, and even in the story, the Buddhas, you know, all the people who came together to create all these images of an ideal, yes. all these uh, um, statues over a thousand years, you know, we're talking a thousand years ago when they were made, have been viewed by millions of people in this time and probably inspired thought in a millions of people, just as the temples in cultures and the monastic who have retained the traditions in cultures and all the lay people who have supported the monastic and practiced themselves and many who have become enlightened, just as all these four conditions have help the greater picture of Buddhism become what it is for us sitting here today. Now you all have a story, you all have history, you all have, are connected to groups and teachers and practices that are connected to what has happened. So I'm talking about in a greater picture yeah. of connection. In that greater pi picture of all of us connected here today, what we see is a very, very complex story and a very powerful one. And when we are, can be open to that in the present, engaged in that in the present, just as you've been very engaged in this conversation, then we, our practice in, is empowered by that. Our mind is connected through that. And that's what we share into when we go back out of here. We share that knowingly and unknowingly. Who we are is what we connect. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about uh, mindfulness and uh, clear comprehension and living the moment. We all know that that leads to wisdom and see the truth. But uh, you uh, explain uh, your own experience, the beauty of what you see in the state of mind. You describe the flowers and the flowers yes, like, yes. Uh, near the waterfall, and the state of mind like that. At that moment, also you get the, the bliss of seeing things as they are. Yes, I think that is the fruit. Not that everybody, not that every teacher necessarily is, uh, as I've talked about in the Diamond Sutra, it's not the ultimate. It's a little bit of the, uh, the Dharma fruit, in the, the, the bliss, so to speak. Uh, if we grasp it, of course, we can miss the deeper teachings, the deeper depth of understanding. But I think as we need to see that to keep our practice alive. We need to experience that. I've seen a lot of shriveled up, sort of bored and angry and tired and rather miserable old practitioners. And we don't really want to be there. You know, I've seen it in myself sometimes, you know, when I get very tired. You know, I watch my own mind at times, you know, slump into poor me. But at least I can, through perhaps the practice to this point, you know, touch in the moment. It's always there. It doesn't have to be in any particular form. You know, for a child wanting to go to sleep, it's there in the thought of, he must enjoy his dreams perhaps, you know, <laughs> to go into this other world and rest a bit there. <laughs> but, you know, in a way it's always there for us to engage in on so many levels. Rather than in the story and the problem making and the manifestation of our suffering. It's about the overcoming of it. It's a little bit like the antidote to being trapped. Yes. Because sometimes one feels trapped. Yes. I think, I think we often feel very trapped in the mind states that we develop mm -hmm. and we feed 
and we make real when they're not really real. You know, the mother's story about a daughter is a fabrication about the daughters, and that's what I not I haven't talked about it in this talk, but later when I felt it was time I could, she had some space to hear. Prior to that, talking is useless. They don't have any space to hear anything. You know, get them to see nature, feel nature, have a walk, freshen the senses, open, bring some joy into your heart. Then you have a little time, a little space to hear something. So then she could hear what was being shared from my experience, and I talked from my, I always talk from my experience, is relevant in her relationship to her daughter. She said, I understand that. I, and there's nothing I'm telling her that's new. I can't tell you anything that you do not know. That's an impossibility. It's the same as what my teacher said. You know, you know how to open your eyes, hands. You know how to see. You know how to hear. If something I say points you back to that, that's all I can do. But you're obviously quite, quite there because you're hearing it. So you wanted to ask something? Yes. So all the questions on learning from the past, uh, is it correct to say that the past is important but it should not be a distraction for the present moment? Yes. Well, the past is, uh, is always a little as years go on, we all know how we develop the past. We, we magnify it. It's that thing of having a magnifying glass. You know, if I can see you clearly with my eyes. If I put you under a magnifying glass, you just become a lot of colour and shape and dots, depending on how I magnify the situation. And if I put you under a telescope, well, you know, you become the same as looking out to outer space, you know, to, <laughs> you become something that's not even recognisable. But our thoughts will do that to the past. We can magnify and intensify a situation that it no longer resembles anything of what that real situation was about because it's all, um, it's all discoloured by so many previous experiences and previous views. So it is useful. It, it's, you're empowered by it. You know what happened five minutes ago? What happened before you came in here? Is valid to you sitting here. There's no doubt, you know. You can all congratulate yourself for getting up this morning and coming on this very, very cold morning. <laughs> so we're not denying that. But you don't stop there. If you just sort of stop and said, oh, well, I'm here, that's it. Go to sleep. <laughs> nice to rest here because when I get up, I'll feel fresh. But you don't hear a single word. Well, it's still good you came. I saw a couple of heads down and you're tired and, and I acknowledged you're tired. But you may not get quiet as much as someone who's hearing, listening. Yeah. Now, that is not uh, recalling what you ate last night. It is how your mind works for something that happened before. Yeah. How your mind react. That's how you move forward. Yeah. How your mind get in, in and tell how you analyze that yeah. for the event before, rather than recalling what you ate last night or yeah. where you went last yeah. night. That will not make you a wiser. No. Right. How you, you yeah. understand how the mind works. Well, you may not eat the same thing if it didn't make you feel good, you may not choose to eat the same thing tomorrow <laughs> night. <laughs> you know, there is some, you know, some wisdom that's innately there that you don't have to reflect on very much. 